If you were here last week, we talked about looking back only for the purpose of moving forward. Some of us look back to stay back, as Pastor Isaac said. We don't want to look back to stay back. We don't want to dwell on the past to keep us in the past. But we reflect on what has happened so that as we think about moving forward, we don't make the same mistakes that we did behind us. Somebody say amen. Amen. I was teaching that to my son recently. We were working on something, and I explained he did something wrong. I explained it to him, and I said, the point of daddy telling you that you did it wrong isn't to make you feel bad. It's because I don't want you to do that again. And so if you make the same mistake again, right, what they say, shame on you. And so when we reflect, when we take time to say, what's happened? What has been going on? Who have I been? Do I like who I've been? Does God like who I've been? And we reflect on that so that we can look forward and say, now, Lord, what will 2018 look like now that you brought me through another year in 2017? Somebody say amen. How many of us want to, 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 to repeat the same issues and challenges and problems that we experienced last year no 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 we're ready to leave that behind us whether that's addiction whether that is an attitude circumstance or situation whether there's actions and behaviors that we did that we're like man I wish I could have that back because I would erase that in a heartbeat you know some people say you live a life of no regrets I think that's bogus if you live a life of no regrets that means you're not willing to recognize that you messed up And if you're not willing to recognize that you messed up, you're probably going to make that same mistake again. I got plenty of regrets. But want to know something cool? God meets me at the point of those regrets, and he simply says, hey, like a good dad, I see that you made a mistake. Let's work on that and not do that again. Doesn't hold it over my head. How many of us are thankful that God doesn't hold it over our head? And that's a little bit of what we're going to be talking about this morning is the loving nature of God. Our God. So as we think about things that we want to change, as we think about things we want to see in 2018, some of us already have some goals, as I mentioned. Let me see. Raise your hand if part of those goals or resolutions have to do with finances. Let's see. Anybody willing to admit? Okay. Praise God. I hope it's all of us. You want to know why? Because if you're better with your finances, we get more tithes here. All right? If you're lame with your finances, then you start coming up with excuses. Oh, pastor, man, I'm back a couple months, and I owe this, that, and the other. Is it cool if I wait to give you tithes in in the summer? There you go. (laughs) There's your answer. (laughs) No, 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 no. You see, it's a, it's a stewardship thing, okay? So finances are important. we got to get our finances in order. How many of us made goals or resolutions that had to do with our health or our fitness? All right, some of us in here. Only a few hands, man, we've got a healthy church or a church in denial, one of the two. But, uh, you know, maybe we can mix those things together, okay? I know I do, right? I know I do. i got some health goals. I want to make this year a good year. Want to know why? Not so that I could be walking around, you know, trying to act like I'm in shape, but because my kids need me for as long as they could possibly have me. My grandkids will need me one day. My church will need me, right? Somebody say amen. So it's not just my responsibility to myself, but I need to look out for my health, for my responsibility to those that I care about, to those that I serve. Somebody say amen. So we got to look at what we eat. we got to look at how much time we're spending moving around, right? we got to look at all these different things. How many of us in here have made some goals about our attitude and emotions? Anybody in here? Okay. Wow, interesting. More of those than, than health. That's okay. All right. We got a church with attitude. I guess that's a, <laughs> we got a church with some attitude, which isn't a surprise, right? But praise God. Okay. But when we think about goals or resolutions in different ways that we want to improve, okay, and it's okay to want to improve. I know some people give taboo language to self-improvement. What I would say is that is something we're trying to do, except the reason why we're doing it is for godly purposes. Somebody say amen? Okay, it's for God. And we recognize that our strength and our motivation and our inspiration to pursue those goals doesn't come from some hedonistic, this worldly approach or belief, but it comes from a desire that God gives us because He wants the best for us. Somebody say, Amen. God wants the best for every single one of us. So as we think about those goals, one of the goals that we will be committing to as a church, as you heard Pastor Josh mention earlier, uh, describing the theme for this year, is the theme of amor or love. Okay, amor is the word uh, that is in Spanish, but it just simply means love, and that's something that we want to commit to. Everybody say amor. 
All right, let's try this out. This is cool. 11 o'clock service is pretty diverse. Does anybody know how to say love in any other languages than English and Spanish? What is it? French. Jet. Nice. Jet Tam. Sarang. Is it Korean? All right. What else? Talofa? Alofa in Samoan. I'm not going to copy that, but that sounds awesome. Finish. That's amazing. Check that out. Any, any others? We got some good ones going on here. In what language? In German. Wow. Amore. Italiano from Dr. G over there. All right. Aloha in Hawaiian. Isn't that kind of cool, guys? We could just, just bust that out of nowhere really quickly in the church. So what, what, essentially, one of the things that we want to commit to as a congregation is that our lives would be formed into the likeness of Christ because who Christ is and who his father is, as he described him, is love. The word of God says God is love. It says in another place in John chapter 13, it says that people will know that you're students of Jesus by how you love one another. Isn't that, let's just pause on that for a second. People will know if you and I are truly disciples of Jesus Christ by the way we demonstrate our love for one another. There could have been so many other descriptors or ways in which we can evaluate our discipleness. For instance, people will know you are disciples of Jesus Christ by how much scripture you have memorized. People will know you are disciples of Jesus Christ by how often you attend church. People will know you are disciples of Jesus Christ by how much you give. That's a good one. Let's keep that in there. People will know how much you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, right, by, by how holy and righteous your life is. No, no, no. It doesn't say any of those things. It says the way that people will be able to tell whether or not you or I are a disciple of Jesus Christ is the way that we love one another. And it's all throughout Scripture, which is why we have decided to focus on that theme for this year, to simply say, God, make us more loving so that our lives can reflect your character. Want to know another cool thing that happens when our lives begin to reflect the character of God? When we learn how to love, and we learn how to love with God's love, not our own love, because if we try to live, love with our own love, it's finite and it's limited, and it's based on how good our day is going. If I'm having a good day, I can love well. If I'm having a bad day, don't count on me. All right, count on me to be sarcastic. Count on me to give you a certain look, to be waiting for you to say something to me. Like, you know what I mean? You know that look when you're kind of just like, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? Right? Right? And you're kind of like, I hope you, I hope you cut me off right now. Right? You see, we start getting a little bit of that crankiness in there. We start getting a little bit of that, that attitude in there. Right? But rather, we simply say, God, I don't want to try to love out of my own resources, but Lord, I want to be able to love others with your kind of love. With your kind of love. You know, the kind of love that God gives us that doesn't expect anything in return. Now that is a rare thing in the world that we live in. You know, I was thinking about that as, uh, you know, the holiday season, you know, you got shopping. I know we got more and more online types of things these days, and so people are spending less time interacting with one another. But maybe over the holidays, there's, there's just a little bit of an increase of going to the store and going here and getting that, you know, especially for guys on, on Christmas Eve, right, as the commercial suggested that everybody's like, oh, man, I forgot. I got to go last-minute shopping, right? Uh, Drea always says that I'm guilty of doing stocking stuffers on the day before. But I beat her this year. I did it on the 23rd. So, you know, there you go. Um, but, you know, the thing about it is when we go and we interact with people, it almost seems like it is so uncommon to experience genuine human love one for the other. It is so uncommon to experience uh, a goodwill, to experience somebody smile, okay? Somebody just say smile. Now, let me see you throw me a smile real quick. Let me see. Come on. Let's, 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 uh, this this section is doing good over here. This section is working on it, okay? Keep going. Keep going. All right? Okay. Let me see them. Let me see those smiles for real. Come on, let me see them. Let me see them. Let me see them. Let me see them. All right, it looks good. It looks good. Okay, good. Well, did you know that scientifically, the more that you smile, it actually impacts the way that you feel? Scientifically, the, the more you smile, 
Some of you are like, but what do you mean, Pastor Cole? But that was the cheesiest, fakest smile I ever gave. Yeah, but it looked better than this. Right? The more we smile, the more it impacts us. And not only that, but it does something to somebody else. Did you know this? Anytime you give somebody a smile, you're giving them a gift. You're gi- and it's a visible it's a visible representation of your heart being open to their presence. It's very opposite of what we typically experience, which is what I was mentioning, that most of the time when we go out and about, it's almost like you expect people to be rude to you and you're surprised when they're nice nowadays. Right? We expect people to kind of just, you know, be short with us. Why? Because we have devalued or undervalued the importance of loving one another. All of our relationships are turning into transactions, right? We're just trying to get something from them, and we'll give something to them. Here, I'll give you this, you give me that, and cool, we're good. Shake on it, peace, right? Marriages sometimes are formed in that way in the world that people are like, okay, as long as you give me sex and as long as I bring home the money, we'll shake on it, and we're good, but there's not really love there. Friendships oftentimes are like this, where it's become transactional. And so we live in a society now where the expectation and the norm is that you're not going to love one another, is that simply we're going to be transactional. We live in a day of efficiency. You know, I've heard it said that it's called the uberification of society. And if you want something, you get it now. Amazon now. Right? I was at home the other day, man, we were just hanging out, chilling, kicking it, working on the house, doing laundry. I would rather do anything rather than do the laundry. But, you know, I love my wife, so there I was, sacrificing away, mama, just for you, okay? What would you say? My own. She said, it's your own laundry. (laughs) I'm telling you, I'd rather do almost anything, man, for real. I'll deep clean, you know? I will. All right. But anyway, um, off the topic, laundry got me confused for a second. And we needed some groceries, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, okay, you ready to go to the grocery store? And Drea's like, oh, they're coming in five minutes. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, they're going to drop them off at our house. And so Amazon pulls up at my house, knocks on the door. I'm like, what's up, Amazon? And they come in, here you go, groceries for Andrea Canales. I'm like, yeah, right here. Boom. Huevos, leche, everything, vegetables. A roast? I'm telling you. We live in a society right now where you, we are getting used to the fact that we can get whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want, by whomever we want, and it's just transactional. I heard another, uh, I saw another uh, a little news report that came up on my phone, a CNN study that was looking at uh, young adults today. And it says that there are more single young adults today than there ever has been per capita, percentage-wise, in the United States of America. So in other words, what they're saying is there are more people that are either not married for one reason or another or choosing not to be married. And then, so there were three factors that they related in this, in this little story, this little study that, that came into my feed from CNN. It says there's more people that are single, but it says they're also more sexually active than ever, okay? And then it says that they, they are reporting higher levels of happiness, Right? And so in other words, the CNN report, whether implicitly or explicitly, was trying to encourage the new trend that young adults are putting off marriage for a long time, that they're still sexually active, and they're happy anyways. In other words, why are people still getting married? married is a, marriage is a thing of the past. And I thought to myself, well, why didn't you include a fourth factor that looks at the number of children that are being raised by one person today? Why don't you include a fifth factor that, 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 that looks at whether or not there are problems emerging from people going around giving themselves to one another just because they're on the same app? Why don't we look at emotional effects of people who are committing to one another in ways that are not connected to long-term commitments? Oh, no, but the CNN study is not going to get that deep. Let's just talk about sex and singleness. You see, when we start thinking about becoming more and more into the character of Christ and allowing our lives to be molded into him, it's important that in 2018, we don't solely focus on trying to have a bigger bank account, a healthier lifestyle, but we simply ask God, Lord, make my heart more like yours. See, because if we think more money and better health makes us happy, I, I guarantee you that if, in, if we did a scientific study at the end of 2018 and people were fit, physically more fit and they had more money in their accounts, I bet you we'd be even more selfish. 
And that's not an excuse to not get your money and your body right, okay, everybody? Okay, I'm just trying to say that we need to have our priorities set in place. Priority number one, love one another. Here's a scripture that, uh, that comes to us out of Luke chapter 15, which is Jesus' summary to a group of spiritual leaders called the Pharisees and the scribes that were critically examining the life and teachings of Jesus. And Jesus told them a, set, a series of three stories in order to demonstrate the heart of God and who God is. And it's our job as followers of Christ to learn from these stories and to ask the questions, how then can my life more reflect the character of God as presented in his word? Luke chapter 15. Are you with me? So verse 1, let's read it together. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. They drew near to him to hear him. But they didn't really want to hear him. You guys know what I'm talking about? They drew near to him to hear him, but they didn't really want to hear him. They were trying to, like, catch him rather than they wanted to hear him. So they, they, uh, the, but the, the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. The Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So this man, Jesus, he receives sinners, and he eats with them. Now, before we run too quickly beyond that verse, let us be reminded that eating together in the first century represented association together, that you didn't associate with people, uh, and you didn't have meals with people, that you, uh, you were different then. And in those days, divisions and separations were very clear. We live in a democratic uh, society here in the United States of America. We don't really have a formal caste system where you cannot actually societally interact with other people. Here, there's, we live in a land that, you know, with, I'll put quotation marks, freedom, where we can do whatever we want. So it doesn't matter how much money you have, what city you're from, what race you are. You can technically dine and be a part of uh, gatherings that have a mixed group of people there. Whereas in this society, it was very clear that you only did things with your own. That included ethnicity, that included socioeconomic status. In, in, in a lot of ways, it even included gender. Men were here, women were there. Men did this, women did that. So there were a lot of separations and divisions, and yet Jesus would challenge those separations and divisions by going and sitting down and having a meal with these tax collectors. Okay, And you're kind of like, well, what's the big deal with tax collecting? I mean, so what? They work for the government. They work for the IRS. Big deal. No, tax collector in those days was the equivalent of basically saying the worst kind of people in society. They were viewed as traitors by the Jews because they worked for the Roman government and they got part of their check from the Roman government. And so they were seen as those who perpetuated enslavement to the Roman Empire. And they also, on top of that, were often thieves where they would demand more than what you actually owed the government so that they would fatten up their pockets a little bit. So you owed, you know, $100 on taxes, they would come and tell you you owed $200 on taxes, and then they'd pocket the rest. So they were seen as thieves, they were seen as traitors, they were not seen as people that you wanted to associate with, yet Jesus wanted to have lunch with them. And it says sinners. It broadly categorizes another group of people just called sinners. And these sinners would include oftentimes visible sinners. Now, how many of us know that all of us in here are sinners? The Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there's not one person who walked in here and who will walk out today that is not a sinner. Okay? All right? That doesn't mean we give ourselves license to go on and keep sinning. But we have to recognize that it's part of our nature and it's what God's trying to cleanse us from. But sinners, as noted in Luke 15, would, re would represent those who were visibly in sin. And I don't want to go and start listing people that would be visibly in sin, but it would essentially be those who everybody knew was living a lifestyle of sin. Jesus would have dinner with them. And that was seen, okay, by the Pharisees and by the scribes as something that religious leaders like Jesus should not do, could not do. Better not do. But Jesus did it anyway. So watch what it says. It says uh, in verse 3, so he spoke to them this parable, and he gives them a first parable, and he talks about the story of the lost sheep. We're not going to get too much into that passage, but I want us to know that he talked about a, a shepherd who had 100 sheep, and out of the 100, lost one and counted 99. And rather than saying, hey, it's about 100, I round up. 
He says, I'm missing a sheep. I'm going to go find my sheep. And the shepherd would do whatever it takes to go and find that one lost sheep. Jesus tells the Pharisees and the scribes this story because of the way they were judging his association with the sinners and the tax collectors. Then he tells them another story, the story of the lost coin. He tells the story of a a woman who had ten silver coins and loses one, and she sweeps the whole home, she looks for it, and finally she finds that final silver coin, and she throws a party and invites her neighbors, and everybody's excited because out of the ten coins that she had, she lost one, but then she found it again. And again, Jesus tells this story to the Pharisees and to the scribes so that they would understand what God is trying to do in society. You see, God, when he sees 100 sheep, he's not satisfied the fact that there's 99 that are safe. He can't wait to find that one lost sheep to bring them back into the fold. So he goes on to tell yet a third parable connected to this story and situation that we find Jesus in. And he tells him this. I'm going to read it. So if you have your Bibles, you can just follow along with me. Or if not, then feel free to listen. And uh, here's the word of God out of Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and following. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went. And he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise, I'll go to my father, I'll tell him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And he ran, and he fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, hey, what's going on here? And he said to him, well, your brother has come, and because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours comes back, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. The father said to his son, Son, you're, are, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is now found. The word of God. And don't you love Jesus? I, I, I just love reading Scripture, and I can't help but fall in love with Jesus over and over again. For a number of reasons. Number one, I love the story. It's a beautiful story. In fact, I believe this story summarizes the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, 
I love the fact that Jesus, whether, I don't know if he was observing an actual occurrence that took place and he wrote it down, remembered it so that it could have it ready to tell a story when somebody judged him for sitting with tax collectors and sinners, or if this is something that God gave him as a vision to illustrate the love of the Father. Now this story is popularly known, famously called the prodigal son. Anybody familiar with that tagline, the prodigal son? In fact, it's used even broader than just spiritual implications these days. You might hear of somebody who just leaves, you know, the, the, the Cleveland Cavs to go play for the Miami Heat, and then all of a sudden they call him the prodigal son when he comes back, or the king, or whatever, I don't know. But we use words like prodigal son for all these different ways, and that's one way to describe the, 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 the story, prodigal. And just for a second, let me define prodigal for us, just so that we're not confused about that meaning. Prodigal does not mean one who has left. The word prodigal means one who is wasteful. One who spends luxuriously, lavishly, without care or thought. That simply lets, lets go of anything that they have, and they are prodigal. They live prodigal living, and, and they simply are not responsible with what they have. That's the definition of prodigal. So people call this the prodigal son because they think it's, about, it's a story about a boy, right, who wanted what he shouldn't have had too soon and went and wasted it and all of a sudden came back. But when we revisit the story again and again and again and again, you begin to notice that the story is really about the father. It's not really about the son. So, so one person described it as the story of the prodigal son. I've heard it also called the prodigal son's. Because we see that this is a story that tells us about the way one son responded and the way another son responded to how that son, what he did when he came back. And so we see this juxtaposition between these lifestyles. And, and you really can make, the, if you look at the story, you really can, can compare that to Jesus' context, which is why he told the story in the first place. Essentially what he's saying is, Pharisees, scribes, you're like the older brother. You're judging the younger brother when, in fact, I want you to be happy that the one who left is coming back home. So, so, so we could really see these parallels, but, it, but if we're really honest about this story, we're going to break it down here in a moment. It really illustrates to us the matchless, the unfathomable, the beautiful love of our Father think this is so significant because Jesus knew the Pharisees and scribes had a different idea of who God was than who God really was and who to tell them the story better than the son of God himself. Jesus says, I think we got to get some things straight, guys, because you're Pharisees and scribes. That means society is looking up to you as religious and spiritual leaders, yet your view of God is wrong. You think God's walking around with a clipboard. Taking note of every single little thing everybody's doing. And you want to make sure that they're aware, very aware. In fact, publicly aware in front of everybody of all the things that you're doing wrong. Who wouldn't want a relationship with God when you see him in that light? We'll just be hiding. We'll just be running. We'll just be staying away from church. Why do you think sometimes people don't want to come into church? Because they think it's filled with hypocritical, self-righteous, judgmental people that can't wait to start telling you all the things that you're doing wrong. I don't want to go into that setting, let alone a sinner who has no hope of the gospel whatsoever. Right? So, so Jesus says, let me tell you about God. Because I think you got some things mixed up. You see, God wants holiness for us. God wants righteousness for us. But not in a way that is to condemn us and cause us to feel ugly and shameful and sinful and distant. But he wants us to be aware of those things because he recognizes that sin kills us. And Jesus wants us to be set free. So let's address those things. But let's do it through love so that we're drawn into a new relationship with the Father that's going to draw us into a new kind of lifestyle that reflects the character of God in our lives. For me, the thing that changed in my mind as I reflect on the character of God and how Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and scribes about this character is that rather than God being an angry God, he's so angry at all of you sinners out there. For Oh, oh man, you shouldn't have. Why would you go back into that sin habit? And, and why would you make that mistake? And why did you do that to your husband or to your wife? And why did you do that to your kids? Or why did you? And, and we have this image of this angry God. In fact, the, the image that has changed my mind is the image of a God who's crying. He's a God who's got tears in his eyes because it breaks his heart to see his children making decisions and living lives that are causing them pain that's ultimately leading to hell. 
and it breaks his heart as a father. I love this passage because when Jesus, this is a passage, my friends, that would cause any reasonable dad to get very angry. Okay, well, first of all, let me back up. There's no mention of mom or, or wife in this story. So that would make me angrier in and of itself. Like, I don't got nobody to talk to about all these issues. I don't got nobody helping out. Maybe he was a single dad. I don't know. It doesn't say anything about mom or wife. And he's trying to raise these kids, and it's a dysfunctional family. But I know we don't know anything about that at Mission Ebenezer because all our families are perfect. Right? Right? But I mean, think about that. You got a spoiled brat kid who's gotten everything he ever wants, and when he asks, when he goes to his dad for his inheritance and his, the right to his estate, he doesn't even ask for it. He doesn't say please or thank you. He just says, Dad, give me my share of the estate. Now, first of all, my son would get one of those real quick. <laughs> if, if, if my son came to me without saying please or thank you and trying to tell me what to do, I'd say, what would you say, boy? Sit down for a second. Hold on before Daddy gets upset. Let's revisit that again. Okay, let's try it together. Daddy, can I please, right? My son talking to me like that. But here comes this, this arrogant younger son, right? And yet his dad deals with him gently. His father deals with him gently. Then you got a, 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 a resentful, bitter, older brother. You got jealousy and sibling rivalry that's going on, and, and they probably never got along because of one thing that happened way back when, and they never figured it out and said sorry to each other, so then things just got more awkward, and they never sat at the dinner table at the same time. One waited for the other to finish before the other one came out, and they never went to the same parties together, and they kept avoiding each other. We have a dysfunctional family going on here. One of them seems like he's, 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 he's responsible and he does all the right things, but in his heart he is hateful. Those are all the things that make up this family right here. And then all of a sudden the one says, I'm out of here, man. I'm done. This house is weird. I'm gone. Dad, the money. Write the check. I need your signature right here. Here's the pen. It's been good. Thank you. Peace. See you when I see you. And he goes and he takes off and it says he goes into a far country and, and, and later on it talks about a citizen from that country. So we know that he skips, he goes into a different, he, so he goes into a place where now he's an immigrant, okay? And, and, he, and he's bawling and he's shot calling and he's having a good time and he's, he's living it up, right? He considered the intrigue of the pleasures of this world as more significant than the monotony and the consistency and stability of his own household and decided to up and leave. And he went and he spent it all and now all of a sudden, now on top of him spending it all, so not only was he broke, but then that country, hit a famine. And a famine in that sense means everybody goes broke. So if you were already broke, then you were double broke. Right? You know, it's hard to be double broke. Okay? That's what happens when you live in a society that's willing to give credit to anybody is you get triple broke. Quadruple broke. Right? It'd take me four lives to get out of debt. Right? And here he is and he says, all right, man, I had enough. Let me just go get a job. So he goes and stands, you know, on the corner with, with a sign that says, we'll work for food. And some dude that take, cares for pigs comes by and says, all right, hop in. Let's go. And he jumps in, and he goes to a farm. And he, when he gets out, he recognizes that it's a pig farm. And if you don't know, for Jews to be associated with pigs is one of the highest levels of defilement that anybody could ever experience. So here he is now stooping to as low as it possibly could be. Again, beautiful illustry, uh, illustration by Jesus to give us this story. If the low as anybody could possibly go, broke, immigrant, in a foreign land, working a job that nobody wants to do. And there he is. And finally he gets this moment, this moment of clarity where he thinks to himself, the servants in my father's house got more bread enough to spare. They got to throw away leftovers over there because of how much they have. And here I am in an immigrant country. I don't even speak the language that they speak. I'm walking around. I got nothing. I got rags for clothes, and I'm trying to eat scraps for lunch, and I got nothing. I'll go back home, and I'll tell my dad. I'll tell him. I'll say, Pop, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done what I did. I was a fool, and I don't deserve to be called your son anymore can you at least let me work in the back? 
I don't care where I sleep. I, you know, as long as if I could just get a, a couple pieces of bread and, and be back here, you don't have to call me your son. I'll give up my last name, you know, but, but if I could be here, it's better than, than where I am right now. It gets to a point of desperation. It gets to a point of no return. It gets to a point where nothing else, he's got no other ways to turn, no other options in his life, and so he, he stoops down that low, and he's, he's getting ready to come back to his dad, and, and so he says, that's what I'm going to do. So he, he, he gets ready, and he just starts walking back home. He starts going, and I love this part of the story. It just it, it gets me every single time as I read this beautiful story that Jesus gave us. And it says here that as he started to walk, as he started to come home, um, he was rehearsing that uh, repentance, that penitential uh, uh, declaration that he's getting ready to give his dad uh, with the hopes that his dad would, would at least allow him to come and, and be one of his hired hands. And he's talking, okay, how am I going to say? I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be. And he's going through it all. And, and, uh, and so he arose, he came to his father. And the Bible says this in, chapter, in verse 20. If you have a highlighter or a pen or anything, I, I want you, if there's anything that is going to drive your year in 2018, I want, us, I want it to be verse 20 of Luke chapter 15. Okay, because this is you and this is me. This is real. It says, and he arose and he came, but when he was still a great way off. Somebody say, a great way off. A great way off. The, the father didn't wait until he rang the doorbell. The father didn't wait until he came and the surveillance video cameras caught him at the entrance of the gate. The father didn't wait. In fact, as soon as they saw movement over there, and at first they probably thought it was just some wild animal walking, but one of the servants comes running into the house, and he simply says, hey, somebody's coming this direction. They're still coming down the 110 right now. They're like up there on Slauson or something, and they're going to be here and like, well, who is it? It looks like it could be, I don't know, well, it's got a lot of long beard. I haven't really, uh, the, the clothes were a little jacked up and didn't have any shoes on, and, and it was barely walking. I don't really know, but, but underneath all that, it looked like it could be your son. It could be who? It could be who? Who'd you say? Hold on one second. And he drops whatever he's doing, and he comes and he breaks the door off of the front door, and he starts running down just in case it might be what the servant said it was. And he started running, and sure enough, the father saw that it was his baby boy. father saw him and he had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him and the son said what he had been practicing to say this whole time he goes uh, father um, I sinned against you heaven in your sight I'm no longer worthy and then the father just goes hold on one second hey you guys go over there I want you to get the robe I want you to get the ring I want you to get the sandals and by the way that fat calf that we've been raising up bring that sucker because we're getting ready to have some carne asada we're getting ready to have prime rib, ribeye, T-bone, filet mignon, chuck steak, hamburgers. Man, we're going to do everything with this cow. Bring it over here. Right, the mariachi. Yeah, you got the. Okay, okay, can I just make a comment really quickly on that? The father didn't respond to his son's request. Right, because the, the son wanted to hear the father say, you're forgiven, and don't worry about it, and it's okay. And the father ignores it and turns to his servants and said, it's party time. I love that. Want to know what that means? That simply means this. When you or I or any lost sinner, somebody that we love and know, somebody that's not in the house of God, all of a sudden decides that it's, they're tired of living in a far country, broke, without any resources, and they just want to come back home, whenever they just get up, something magical happens. Something beautiful happens where the Father's heart stirs up from within him, and without him even having to give you a verbal response, he simply makes sure that all process gets going so that we can celebrate that you returned and came back home. That's God. The father, they don't have a long conversation about, well, you know, you shouldn't have done that in the first place. And, uh, you know, you put me about, you know, let's see, 35 back. 
And uh, it's going to take you about 10 years to get back into this status so we could break even. Um, you know, so I just want to make sure you truly understand what you did, right? The father doesn't get into that conversation. He doesn't even say you're forgiven. He simply says this, boy, I thought you was dead. But you ain't, and you're home. And this daddy is happy. Oh, man, that's God's love for us. That's God's love for us. That's God's love for you. That's God's love for this world. That's God's love for that rude person at Walmart that took the last card even though you were walking toward it. Even if it had a wobbly wheel, the card's better than no cart. That's God's love for lost sinners. That's God's love for those who are broken. That's God's love for a drug addict. That's God's love for an alcoholic. That's God's love for a father who left the home when he shouldn't have. That's God's love for a woman who's trying to raise five kids on her own self. That's God's love for a gang member. That's God's love for the little babies, and that's God's love for, for the elders. Oh, man, his love is amazing. I love that Jesus told this story. He had a bank of stories, and he told this one. He, brought, he pulled this one out. And he said, Pharisees, scribes, you got to get on the same page as your God. Because your God loves that lost boy more than you could ever imagine. But I love it that Jesus doesn't start, stop the story there. He keeps telling it because he tells us about the older brother. Okay, and the way, like, the way my spirituality works sometimes is I get really judgmental about the judgmental. Did you get that? Right? I get, real, I get, I get irritated at those who are self-righteous and judgmental. Who you think you are judging other people, man? Look at, the, look at me, you. Where was you at 10 years ago? All of a sudden trying to act like you're better than somebody, calling somebody this, that, and the other, talking behind somebody, texting out, saying all this, that, and the other. You think you are someone. I start judging the judges. That's me. I don't know if anybody can relate. But Jesus says, oh, man, he, he includes this part of the story. And then, then he continues. He goes, oh, well, the other brother didn't even come inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> trying to act like he didn't hear the, the mariachi, right? Trying to act like nothing, you know, well, I'm just doing my own thing, doing my thing, clink, 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 clink. Everybody else is inside. He's over there by himself working, you know what I mean? Like go, going away, and they come and say, hey, what's going on, man? Let's tell, go tell me what's happening. And he says, well, your little brother came home. Who? I don't have a little brother, right? Oh, my little brother, the one that went and wasted all my dad's money? I could have had a, uh, uh, you know, he wasted one-third of what I could have had, right? Who came, who came home? My little brother. And he comes in, right? And dad's excited to tell his big brother that his little brother came. The big brother just looks like this. So I, I've never left your side, dad. I've always done everything you've asked me to do. I've always been good. I've always been right here. I never made one big mistake like this. And I've never even had a chicken sacrificed so that I can have some, some chicken tacos. Right? He's bitter. He's like, Dad, this dude has messed us up, and now you're rewarding him. Look at him. He looks like a king now that he got that fresh haircut and that shave with the warm cloth, which I never had, but it seems like it's cool, so maybe 2018. Right, the, the big brother starts looking over there and starts saying, you know, Dad, this don't seem fair to me. See, it's kind of like when somebody lives their whole life trying to be right with God and, and trying to do as if they could earn their way into heaven. And then all of a sudden somebody who's lived 30, 40, 50 years of their life throwing it away, right, anything, everything and anything you can imagine, all of a sudden they come to the altar one time and with the repentant heart, the Lord Jesus gives them salvation and eternal life. And the person over here is like, man, I've been to Bible study every week and I never felt that kind of joy. What's up, God? Right? By the way, I need to tell them they shouldn't be wearing that in church. Right? How many of us know how, you know, jump, jump? Right? Somebody just barely coming to the Lord, and we're already trying to, like, you know, you square them away, you know, just trying to tell them, like, they shouldn't be wearing that much makeup, man. You know? But they don't know. They don't know any better, huh? Right? Everybody starts, you know, say, hey, let's not start talking like that because that's older brother kind of stuff. But here's the cool thing. So the story doesn't end there. So here this older brother has this attitude, but the father loves the older brother also. 
Right? He's so patient, this father. So loving, so compassionate. And he turns toward the big brother. And, and see, I, if I were the father, I would have told him off too. <laughs> I would have told the younger boy off, like, you arrogant little. And the big brother, I would have come up to him and tell him, man, you're not excited that your brother's here. You're at, at the, we thought he was dead. And you see him, he's alive. Right? And, and you're not, you know, I, I would have been getting into him. And inst- instead, really patiently, the father looks at him and says, hey, man, look. Your brother came home. And by the way, everything I have here, that's yours. Everything I've ever made, that's yours. All this stuff is yours. Shoot, the clothes I'm wearing right now, when I'm not here, this is yours if you want it. Right? Everything I have is yours. He's he's still gentle with the older brother and loving the older brother. In other words, as we think about Amor 2018, as we think about this coming year, all right, may we be driven with the love of God as illustrated in this beautiful story of the prodigals. Um, Timothy Keller, a pastor in New York City, wrote a book that's called The Prodigal God. And he interprets the story, but looking at it through the lens that the one who's actually willing to be wasteful, the one who's actually willing to give more than what's required, more than what's necessary, is the way God is with his grace toward you and me. He doesn't hold back any bit of it. How much do you need? I got enough. How much do you need? I got enough. How much wounds and brokenness do you have in your life? I got enough. How much hurt and pain do you have because of your family background or your church experience? I got enough. How many things have happened to you in your childhood and your life? Well, guess what? God's got enough grace for you too. His grace is sufficient for us. His love is sufficient for us. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how we've done it, the kind of God that we serve is the God that can't wait for us to come back home.